Uh, I'm a senior director in the Secure Development Group inside Trustworthy Computing, TWC, uh, at Microsoft. Unfortunately, due to a family emergency at the weekend, my boss, Steve Littner, uh, could not come along today as scheduled. But fortunately, um, I was due to attend the International Common Criteria Conference down the road, uh, so I could come along and talk about this important topic. And uh, I was actually thinking how madly overdressed I am, but you can tell where I've come from. I think this is the first time I've ever been in a room where I've been the only person wearing a tie. Except I see that George has got a tie on, so thanks for making me feel less uncomfortable. Um, so I, I actually I sat in through the last panel and I, and I found the discussion fascinating. I think the challenges that you were talking about, about providing a valuable service that's actually hard to sell, it is really a very, very hard thing to do. But hopefully some of the topics I'm going to talk about in this session uh, will give you some hope. And I, and I think ultimately it does become down to, a set, uh, to, to a, an issue of actually figuring out what it is that people need to do and providing it so that they can actually do it. And preferably do it in a, in a consumer environment where you know, basically it just happens and the right things happen. So, those of you who monitor Microsoft's pronouncements will know that we, particularly those of us in TWC, have long been addressing ourselves to the growing challenges around establishing confidence in an increasingly complex and fragmented computing environment. The, works of, the work of groups such as TCG and industry initiatives such as TPM are very much supportive of our goals in TWC. I'd like to spend the next 30 or so minutes providing a broad perspective on cybersecurity, drilling into the specific role of and need for trusted computing and hardware roots of trust. Then I'd like to walk through some aspects of Microsoft's journey in trusted computing and security and close with a call for action for the future. Hopefully there'll be time for some Q&A, although um, given my last, sort of last minute deputization, I may have to defer to some of the subject matter experts in the room, like David, for example. So, I refer to our increasingly complex and fragmented environment. Let me illustrate what I mean. And of course, these days, everybody has to look at either a threat landscape or some kind of survey of trends. But this is what we actually see in the world today. The world around us is transforming in terms of the way we create, store, and consume data. Innovation and technology adoption are moving at a fearsome pace and present us as security professionals with many challenges. As always, we need to address those challenges with good judgment. This comes back to the discussion a little bit ago, so as not to detract from the benefits of the innovation. Today's organizations seek to drive business innovation by implementing technologies, including uh, mobility technologies, social networking, cloud, and big data. These large-scale trends are transforming how we access people and information. In the world of mobility, a recent study asserted that smartphones are now outselling feature phones. I'm not quite sure whether that's true, but it, it kind of feels true. And it's definitely evident that tablets are increasingly important uh, for today's mobile workforce. Those trends are changing the way that we do our work. And by 2016, smartphones and tablets will be in the hands of over a billion global consumers. Billion. Our work patterns are also changing, and by 2015, the world's mobile worker population will reach 1.3 billion. That's over 37% of the total workforce. The last several years, I've also seen the emergence of social networking as a phenomenon. Millennials, the generation who's grown up with Facebook and Instagram, will make up 75% of the American workforce by 2025. Coupled with that, organizations are also looking for new ways to drive collaboration and to harness the power of social networking mindset. And 65% of companies are deploying at least one social software tool today. We've been talking about the move to the cloud for several years, but now more organizations are adopting public, private, and hybrid cloud models to drive their business forward. Over 80% of new apps were distributed or deployed on clouds in 2012 and 70% of organizations are either using or investigating cloud computing. Big data. Digital content grew to 2.7 zettabytes in 2012. That's up 48% from 2011. And it's looking like that will grow to 8 zettabytes by 2015. To put that in perspective, 
I recently saw a piece that estimated that the total amount of spoken discourse throughout history could be stored in around 42 zettabytes. I guess we're a bit more duplicative and repetitive on the internet, I'm guessing, but that's still a lot of data. As data volumes continue to grow, organizations want to unlock the meaning from government or business data to drive innovation. And over the next five years, we'll see 80% growth in unstructured data. And all of, those present, all of those trends present us with challenges. Mobility is driving the growth of Bring Your Own Device. We just talked about BYOD quite a bit. And seeing non-corporate assets joining corporate networks with all the attendant risks. Social networking brings with it increased social engineering, cyberbullying, and worse. The responses there may not be all technolog technological, but they do raise issues that we at Microsoft have been talking about for several years in terms of the wider social context. A recent spate of stories spring to mind, and many of you will be following the coverage of prominent Twitter users being harassed and threatened by people abusing the anonymity of the internet. In the case of cloud, we see the challenges of protecting data within the cloud and authenticating devices and services. And finally, big data brings with it very understandable concerns about the difficulty of controlling the uses of the data once it is actually collected. And of course, these concerns become real in the stories we read pretty much every day. A gentleman there referred to the, um, or over there actually, referred to the coverage um, of um, the BSI comments uh, in the German press about the, about the TPM. Um, you get both, both sides of the story, you actually get real incidents and you get speculation. But I think, I think the problem there is that there is a lot of concern about security uh, in the wider world. And, and these stories really don't serve to help. I refer to the Twitter instances, but there are, here are some other headlines um, that have come from the last year or so. And what they do is they illustrate the wide variety of targets that now exist, traditional ones like ATMs and debit cards, but also cars. I, I saw one recently about um, heart pacemakers or, or something like that. The range of adversaries that we race, uh, face is also growing and has gone from the traditional nation states and perhaps the recently traditional uh, criminal gangs to hacktivists. But the good news is that through the work that is being done in communities such as this, there are hopeful ways forward. So let me start by spending a couple of minutes talking about a vision articulated by Scott Charney, Corporate Vice President of Trustworthy Computing, in a paper released back in 2008 and a talk given by Craig Mundy, also at Microsoft, at the RSA conference in the same year. Scott enunciated a set of challenges and drivers not dissimilar from the ones I just outlined in terms of increasingly disintermediated world with malware and social engineering giving rise to botnet, cyber espionage, advanced persistent threat, and the anonymity of the internet giving rise to crimes such as threat, threat sorry, as theft, uh, identity theft, and child predation. He set out the view that our previous approaches to addressing these problems, such as secure development, which is an area very close to my heart, exploit mitigation, defense of death, etc., were necessary but not sufficient. In his description of end-to-end -end trust, Scott stressed the centrality of trusted stacks, which I'll talk about in a, in a couple of minutes. In the intervening five years, uh, governments, companies, and citizens have become surprisingly familiar with security concepts through increased exposure to those shared challenges. I guess it's not that surprising when you, when you actually put it that way. And that's kind of a good outcome in many ways because it raises awareness of the need for some of the things that groups like this are, are actually doing. Industry solutions for dealing with the concepts of Microsoft's original end-to-end -end trust vision have also matured. And in the standards space, we see identity and data operational capabilities defined in standards like ISO 27001 and 27002, and other standards, particularly the recently published ISO 27034 1, will hopefully lead to more trustworthy software being produced. Most relevantly to an audience like this, devices are taking increased advantage of standards like the TPM specification to establish a foundation for the trusted stack. So let's talk a little bit about the trusted stack. The concept, as Scott um, laid it out, 
is logical and fundamental to our ways of thinking. The underlying hardware must be trustworthy. Because it is trustworthy, it can serve as a hardware for root of trust. Of course, trusted hardware is of very little use without trusted software, such as operating systems and trusted applications running on top of it. And given that software operates on data, so the data itself has to be trusted, and the whole model falls down if the identities of the users, applications, systems, etc., interacting with the software and the data can also be trusted. Trusted computing technologies have been developed and have become widely available through the efforts of organizations like TCG. TCG defines specifications for hardware such as TPM. And today, the TPM can be found on more systems than ever before. And Microsoft is very proud to have contributed to the original TPM specification and our sustained efforts in trusted hardware through our long-term participation as a uh, promoter member of the trusted computer group, computing group. With new advances in trusted computing technology or other hardware-based security features, Microsoft has moved quickly to provide our customers with access to those features with the result of practical benefits. And I'd like to cover some of those innovations we've made available to our customers over the next few slides and probably, well, hopefully, illustrate some of the scenarios that might make what we're talking about more compelling. So Windows Vista was released in 2006, and while it's not been a very well-loved operating system, including inside Microsoft, it should be pointed out that it raised the security bar in several important ways. I'm not going to let the opportunity pass to talk about the security development lifecycle, or SDL, and I'll talk about that some more in a few moments. But now, for now, it should be pointed out that Windows Vista was the first operating system product from Microsoft that was de developed using the SDL throughout. Complementing the TCG publication of the TPM 1.2 spec, in 2005, uh, Vista, released one year later, had support for TPM 1.2, including a Windows API for third-party applications to use the TPM, and a user interface uh, to allow basic management tasks, such as resetting the TPM. Windows Vista included a, a new fe feature called BitLock BitLocker Drive Encryption. BitLocker protected the OS volume and data volumes from disclosure by encrypting their contents. This feature enabled the scenario we commonly refer to as the lost laptop, allowing data on lost systems to be protected from disclosure. And I know that the gentleman in the previous session discussed that at some length. BitLocker encrypted volumes can have different protectors that release the encrypted key for, uh, for the volume, either during the boot process for the OS volume, or after boot for data volumes. The default protector simply uses the TPM to establish a trusted stack. But for customers with higher security needs, Vista included a TPM plus PIN protector, requiring that a PIN also be entered to boot the system. For recovery scenarios, a 48-digit recovery key could be printed out, or a key could be stored on a USB device or backed up to the Active Directory. Windows 7, released two years later, added more enhancements in the area of smart cards, Windows 7 featured enhanced support for smart card related plug and play and the NIST Personal Identity Verification PIV standard. This means that users of Windows 7 can use smart cards from vendors who have published their drivers through Windows Update without needing uh, special deployment middleware. These drivers are downloaded in the same, same way as drivers for other devices in Windows. Similarly, when a PIV compliant smart card is inserted into a smart card reader, Windows attempts to download the driver from Windows Update and if no appropriate driver is available, um, it will use uh, a PIV compliant mini driver that's included with, with Windows 7. There are also a number of enhancements to BitLocker, such as BitLocker to go protection for, rem uh, for removable data volumes, the ability to use smart cards to unlock data volumes and removable media, the ability of data recovery agents to allow FIPS compliant deployment, and the ability to use a new protector type, adding USB to TPM and PIN providing higher security than the previous solution. Between the release of Windows 7 and Windows 8, TCG drove some major developments. One such development was to offer more choices around TPM provisioning. The result was that new hardware became available that allowed TPM provisioning to happen without any user interaction. Older designs required users to interact with the BIOS to activate the TPM. With Windows 8 and newer hardware, Microsoft was able to have 
the operating system provision and enable the TPM by default and to manage it. Having the OS manage the TPM lets the OS and applications work together to use the functions more easily. The Windows team in Windows 8 provided mitigation against boot malware by convincing platform manufacturers to implement UEFI Secure Boot, which enforced security for boot firmware. The systems with a TPM, Windows 8 enhanced the measurement of firmware components recorded in the TPM during boot to include the software components that start the Windows 8 operating system kernel and anti-malware components. Anti-malware <coughs> component support was improved to allow it to start as the first third-party components on the system. The result is that the early launch anti-malware, ELAM, is more effective on Windows 8 systems and systems with a TPM gain the benefit of measured boot. Boot measurement reflecting the start state of the operating system can be cryptographically proven to help determine the health of the device and establish trust. Microsoft Windows 8 hardware certification requirements. Um, sorry, I lost my thread there. A little thing came up on my screen. Um, Microsoft Windows 8 hardware security uh, certification requirements define a class of platform that Microsoft is now calling Instant Go. These requirements are listed in the connected standby system requirements in the Windows hardware certification requirements. And systems that meet these requirements have hardware support that works in conjunction with the operating system to increase battery life, but also to, uh, to also include stronger hardware security features like prohibitions against direct memory access through system ports and prohibiting hardware, de hardware debuggers being used on end user customer systems. These improvements provide greater defense in depth from hardware-based attacks. For consumer systems, Instant Go also provides device encryption, and this is based on BitLocker technology to protect data, but is easier for consumers to use with safeguards like backing up the consumer's recovery key to their Microsoft account. This provides better protection for BYOD scenarios accessing corporate data. Direct use of a TPM for authentication has not been widely adapted within the industry. And again, this was a topic that was uh, touched on in the last, uh, in the last section. Um, however, the industry is familiar with PKI scenarios, um, which use public key certificates or smart cards for a variety of purposes. Windows 8 includes capabilities to specify that the private keys bound to certificates must be stored on the TPM. This provides defense in depth because even if a system is compromised, the TPM bound credentials cannot be exported off the machine and used elsewhere. And this starts to sound very like uh, a smart card. And Windows 8 also includes a virtual smart card feature, making the TPM look like a permanently inserted smart card. This allows enterprises to easily de uh, deploy and adopt TPM if they already have existing smart card infrastructures in place. And the biggest TPM-related change for Windows was the adoption of support for TPM2 with all the same features as, as were supported in, uh, in TPM 1.2. So I'll just touch on the TPM 2.0 library standard, um, and I know that David Wharton is um, doing a keynote on that, I think, tomorrow. Uh, so he will definitely deal with this in much more detail than I can in a session like this. But I think it represents a major accomplishment for the organization, addressing current and future needs uh, for trusted computing. The interface is designed to be cryptographically agile to support more algorithms with minimal change. The specification also includes reference code for a TPM 2.0 implementation, making implementations more uniform and less costly to develop. The specification also has more fine-grained controls to separate the management of privacy functionality versus security functionality. Um, with the upcoming release of Windows 8, we've added more features, and I believe that those will be covered also in another talk by uh, Chris Hallam from Microsoft, which I think is this afternoon at 1.30, but I have a slide on that later on. So Windows 8.1, literally just around the corner, comes just a year after the release of Windows 8. As we saw, the ability to provision certificates bound to the TPM was added to Windows 8. Windows 8.1 enhances this functionality by making it possible to have the TPM do key attestation and verify that the private key was actually provisioned in the TPM. 
With Windows 8.1, virtual smart cards are now ready for BYOD. An API supporting provisioning has been added to make it easy to use those machines that are not joined to the domain. Provable PC health is a new feature that uses the TPM uh, measured boot information along with information about the health of client systems to better protect malware. More information on this will be covered in Chris's talk at 1.30 today. Clearly Microsoft has invested in trusted computing in the past and we will continue to do so in the future with important security features to delight our customers. So I'd like to just spend a couple of minutes going back to my home territory, which is software. And I have to say that Microsoft has embraced trusted computing to establish the hardware portion of the trusted stack. But if I flip around the, uh, the saying that, um, that things like secure development methodologies are necessary but not sufficient, equally it's obvious that trusted hardware itself is necessary but not sufficient without those techniques. And I'd like to spend a few moments looking at how Microsoft approaches the software aspects of building a trusted stack. This is a recent example of a FTC report uh, chiding some company about not ha having failed to take reasonable steps to secure the software it develops. Well, that's not the only example. It's a good example, but it's not the only example. And increasingly, regulatory bodies and standards are asking for things like uh, for SDL, uh, or secure development methodologies, to be used in the development of, soft, uh, of software. And recently, uh, the Security Development Lifecycle, or SDL, uh, was included as an appendix to 27034 um, as an example of uh, a secure software development methodology. And Microsoft attested to that at the uh, recent um, Secure Development Conference in San Francisco uh, in May. There's a lot to talk about with the SDL, so I, I will make this very brief. Uh, the SDL was the more programmatic response that Microsoft came up with um, to the incidents, the code reds and the nimbers of the uh, early 2000s. Initially our response was to um, take um, the products offline towards the end of their development cycle and look for, look for problems, but clearly that has some problems in terms of any architectural uh, issues that you find. You just can't fix them in the last phases. So the SDL was designed to incorporate security, from, uh, security development methodologies into the actual development process. And you can see that there are five main phases that happen on every release, requirements gathering, design, implementation, verification, and release. And some of the key activities that take place in those different phases, building an understanding of the risks um, in the process, threat modeling and attack surface reduction, uh, the use of tools and, and removal of band function, uh, band function, static analysis, dynamic analysis, testing that mitigations were actually implemented that were identified in the threat modeling, and a final security review. So, in conclusion, I think it should be fairly obvious, Microsoft is very committed to, the, uh, to trusted computing. TPM 2.0, is ready for adoption today and will be pervasive by 2015. And platforms like Windows 8.1 and future platforms of Windows will increase our support for it. Microsoft looks forward to TCG certification programs uh, for, uh, for TPM 2.0. And just as uh, some future information, I've uh, already forward referenced these, but uh, Chris Hallam has a talk on Windows 8.1 security. Uh, today, 1.30, and David has his keynote tomorrow at 9 o'clock. So, um, I'm not sure where we are with time. Um, we have quite a bit of time if anyone wants to uh, ask some questions. I may well defer them to the experts, though. So. No questions? Let's go. So I noticed you didn't mention that uh, Windows 8 has a KSP that hooks into the TPM, so that you can uh, a whole bunch of software that uh, can use um, security tokens can suddenly use the TPM. And, um, why don't you market that a little better? Um, well, 
I, I thought I actually mentioned the use of smart cards uh, for the TPM, but I do have the virtual smart card. But that's right. a little different from the KSP. No, I actually I mentioned the use of the ability to use a smart card to to encrypt uh, to to unlock the TPM as well. I I, I got through a lot of stuff in a, in a short period of time, but it's a good point. Any other questions? Yeah, it seems like, it seemed like you addressed a lot of you know the endpoint security issues, uh, but you know we're all moving to cloud. Uh, we need to have servers that have all these capabilities as well. So what are the plans for TPM inclusion and the whole architecture in Microsoft's server products? I think I would have to defer that one to David because I I don't know what we're actually talking about in that space. So. We're not talking about anything in that space at this time. Okay. So that's a, a simple and unfortunate answer. Sorry about that. One truism of security is that when uh, users have to choose between the uh, dancing pigs um, or whatever the latest uh, fad is, uh, some e promising email offer that they've just received, and uh, following the recommendations of their IT security group, they always choose the dancing pigs. <laughs> and I'm afraid that um, this is leading to a, a broader trend uh, with BYOD where they purchase the device uh, that displays the dancing pigs most uh, comingly, um, and, uh, and then they go to their IT security department and demand that it work with the uh, corporate um, uh, security environment. What do you view as the prospects for uh, us um, in being able to uh, to shortcut this uh, perhaps inevitable um, circumstance um, or uh, deliver systems that uh, allow for IT security to be maintained in spite of this uh, phenomenon? Um. I don't know. I don't know if it's a truism, but it's a fundamental problem in security that ultimately, um, at some point, your users have some power over the system. Um, social engineering, which is effectively what you're talking about, will probably be the last security problem we ever have to solve because we will never be able to solve it. I think the only thing that we can really do is look forward to times when the systems themselves are more resilient and. Um, and we'll be able to uh, protect the, the, limited, uh, the limit of the damage that we can do. I think, I think the B BYOD um, issue raises some um, interesting questions. <coughs> I was catching the discussion about consumerization. And, I, and it's interesting that Microsoft's first foothold in the enterprise was really through consumerization, if you like, which was cutting out the IT manager and departmental servers being installed on, on PCs because of the ease of use. And if you had looked at that back in the day, you might have thought, well, hang on a second, the IT guys are losing control of the, system, uh, of the system. And really what happened was that the systems themselves had to put themselves into some kind of a, a management space. And that's where you saw the growth of Microsoft Enterprise products like, like uh, NT, NT Server, and you saw technologies like um, Group Policy so that we could actually uh, enforce policy and compliance across the enterprise. I think if you, if you regard BYOD as being effectively you give up everything, then it's hard to see you know, where the future lies. I think as things move on, the cost of using your own device at work will have to be making it more increasingly government governed. That's my personal view. Um, I, I don't see how you get around that. If you want to enable people, there has to be some level of policy. And I know that non-domain joint policy has been something that we've looked at uh, for, for, for many years. <clears throat> so I guess the long and the short of it is users will always do what users do. Um, managers should always do what managers do. And the end point will only be really reached when we can limit the amount of damage that they can do just looking at pigs and not downloading any malware, etc. Long-winded answer. Hopefully it got to the point. Yes, thank you. I have a question that's on perhaps a slightly different angle with, with your background in this, the secure software development process and an awareness of Microsoft's broader adoption of trusted computing across its product lines. 
how do you see that trust computing technologies applied within the software development process and the integration of the trust computing technologies more deeply into um, actual application development and work so that as we as we move from simple identity where the products are today to the future of things like trusted execution and how do I not necessarily have a whole OS be the trusted execution environment but have higher assurance for components of software how that might affect the secure software development process and is it something that is part of the topic in conversation for Microsoft today? <coughs> Well, let me give a little bit more background than what SDL is. Um, it's called the Security Development Lifecycle. But actually, for the, for the longest time, the first at least half of its history, much of what it was addressing was quality. So you do static analysis to stop developers uh, from overwriting buffers. And they don't usually intend to do that one, would assume. So much of, the, much of the effort is actually making the code do what it was really intended to do. So a lot of the SDL addresses things like that. <clears throat> but the SDL also consists of um, also consists of a, a cryptographic standard, the SDL crypto policy. And what that does is deals with the issues like deprecation of crypto algorithms, increases in key lengths, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And as these technologies become more and more pervasive, then the crypto policy um, has to move to actually address. Uh, the uses. There's kind of a fine line in the sense that much of the functionality is actually done by security groups inside Microsoft, but the SDL itself has um, things like TPM potentially have a future part to play as, for example, if there is a TPM present, which increasingly there will be, or always there will be, then you should store keys on the TPM, for example, rather than using other, other technologies. Um, the other trend, though, is really um, more about making it so that the policy itself is inherent in the way that you use the system. And that doesn't just apply to users, it applies to the way that developers develop. If I give you an API that says store a key, then it should store the key in the right way. And that becomes more of a functionality discussion so that, uh, so that SDL doesn't really need to, to deal with that. But I think it does have a role to play. Hopefully that answers the question. Hi. I see there's a pretty big emphasis on uh, TCG, TPM, and the overall strategy. What about uh, TCG, Opal, self-gripping hard drives? Where do they fit in with Windows? And I couldn't answer that question, David or Rob. There was some support added for self-gripping drives in Windows 8. So maybe that would be a question to raise with Chris. Uh, in case you didn't catch the answer, Rob said that he believed that uh, there had been some support in Windows 8 uh, for self-encrypting drives in order to, uh, in, in bit locker scenarios. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, so BYOD has this property that is the uh, very, very, very akin to inside of attacks, right? I mean, so this is the, the same sorts of things you have to worry about insiders, you have to worry about BI, BYOD, and so forth and so on. So it turns out uh, the Microsoft Exchange server supports S5, which allows you to send security mail and, 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 and so forth and so on. But in the S5 spec, uh, in, in both versions of the S1 spec, you should be able to do two uh, certificates. You should be able to say, uh, this is me, and this is my machine, okay? Uh, but currently, the way Exchange works is it just looks at the first certificate you give it, and that's the only thing it uses, okay? But we all know, uh, from banking experience with safety deposit boxes, you have two people who have to pull the key, okay? You get rid of insider attacks. It's a wonderful deal. Okay. You don't get rid of them. You make them harder because collusion is harder. To it's do. harder. It's harder to get two people to agree to do the same thing. And so BYOD, like insider, are all the same thing. But it seems that uh, Microsoft uniformly does not support anding two parties together in a cryptographic way. 
And so one of the things I vote for is that Microsoft stop supporting it. It's part of the spec. It's written as a standard, and I would love to see it. Specifically for S-MIME, or as a general property? S-MIME, uh, almost throughout Microsoft. Um, uh, so, so there are ways you can write your own code okay, to do it, but within the normal mechanisms that regular people have, um, you can't do it pretty much. It's an interesting property. Uh, it would be a nice thing to uh, see Microsoft start, start supporting. You could argue that one of the properties of domain join is that you actually authenticate the machine as it comes onto the network. Uh, yes and no. So, so, so that's not a. Uh, so I was I was bringing this up in the VYOD mesh insider attack framework. Uh, so, so the answer is it might get into the domain with VPN or whatever. I've done it. It only takes a single sign on. So it's just a thing. Yeah, but um, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say, I mean, definitely if you have a non-domain joint machine that isn't subject to policy and you let it have lots of access to your network and you're asking for certain problems to occur, uh, you don't want malware state that machine if it's actually in your network, if you're VPNing in, uh, it's difficult. But for so example, in corporations like Microsoft, we require the use of smart cards to use VPN. So, so this, this is a fun discussion. So the, the, uh, so the s spec allows me to hand as many to get things together as I want, but there's two ways to do it. Okay? One is a direct Boolean hand, and the other one is by uh, essentially word volume. Okay? And it pre prevents both, and exchange uh, does not allow either. Uh, most of the most of the S mine support, as far as I understand it, historically was to uh, for defence customers, and use of S mine has never really been quite what everybody was expecting. Very few people. I mean, I, I use S mine maybe five six times a year, and I use it a lot. Any other questions? No. Well, thanks very much for your time. Apologies that Steve Lipman couldn't make it, but I um, very much enjoyed the session. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. And thank you for our audience questions. Um, we are going to take another five minute break. So for those of you looking to use the Wi-Fi, it is WAVE registration, and the password is ROSEN, all lowercase, 2013. Um, there's coffee in the exhibit hall, and we'll see you back here in five. Thanks.